we have a couple standalone issues this time, as we have Shadow of the Bat issues number 24 and 25. Both issues are written by Alan Grant, with colors by Adrian Roy and lettering by Todd Klein. 24 has art by Vince uh, Garano, which means both uh, inks and pen are the, yeah uh, inks and pencils, and 25 has pencils by Brett Blevins and inks by John Beatty. Issue number 24 opens at night on the docks in Gotham, the second worst place to be in Gotham at night outside of abandoned amusement parks. Some goons are shaking down a woman who has apparently come to Gotham illegally. Asbat shows up and the goons back off with feigned innocence, but Asbat calls them out and then takes them out. After driving the goons off, Asbat learns the story of the woman, Rosemary. She is from a unnamed war-torn Latin American country where she, her husband, and her children were subsistence farmers. When her family couldn't afford to pay taxes to the various multiple factions in the war, her husband was arrested by the government. In desperation, in order to get the money to pay the bribes to get her husband back, she ended up selling one of her children to someone who said they'd be taken to a rich American family in California where they'd be safe. Well, the first part's right. They were taken to a rich American family, but one in Gotham City. Now, she tells Asbat all of this in Spanish, which Jean-Paul is surprised to discover he understands. He then passes this info to Gordon, who says he's put Rosemary under the protection of Rene Montoya. We then intercut between Asbat's own investigation and the rest of this story, which was presumably told earlier. On Asbat's end, he traces the child smuggling ring to a fertility clinic, and from there he plants a bug in the office of a doctor at the clinic and hears their sales pitch for the child sale, and then goes to catch them in the act at the meet. Flashing back to Rosemary's backstory, she found out that when going to pay the bribe to free her husband, she learned that he'd already been killed in a quote-unquote prison uprising, so she took the money to get her child back, ultimately leading her to Gotham. Back with Jean-Paul, through interrogating the doctor of camera, he learns when the next delivery is due. The couriers rumble to Asbat's presence and flee, ultimately bailing from the van while it's in motion. Asbat manages to stop the vehicle before a disaster occurs, and the story ends with Gordon and the GCPD going through the doctor's client list, while Jean-Paul reflects on the mother he never knew. Issue number 25 opens on the corrosive man breaking out from Star Labs in Gotham, killing several guards along the way. Our perspective then shifts to Joe Public, who you may recall from the Bloodlines uh, event, who is once again on patrol and stops some muggers before Asbat shows up and points out that the victim of the muggers was the runner for a gang before Asbat is called away due to the corrosive man's breakout. Speaking of the corrosive man, his internal monologue reveals he's going after Mort Cadaver, who is currently in the hospital. Asbat catches up to the corrosive man and tries to fight him, but is easily overpowered. Joe Public sees the aftermath and tells Asbat, again, that cadaver's at the hospital. Asbat hurries there and sees the corrosive man and a large pressurized fuel tank, presumably for the hospital's emergency generators. Asbat tries using material on hand to stop the corrosive man's approach without success until Joe Public arrives and is able to drain the corrosive man's powers away until Asbat can cover him with a dump truck load of stand. Asbat ungratefully berates Joe Public, in spite of Joe Public having far more information about how the corrosive man's powers work and what his motivation was than Asbat did, and Joe Public not only being instrumental to taking down the corrosive man, but Asbat being completely unable to take him down at all without Joe Public's help. Asbat even refers to it as bungling when Joe Public did nothing to interfere. Indeed, he saved Asbat's ass. Arguably, Asbat's ostracism of Tim Drake meant that the person who could have tipped him off to the corrosive man's abilities and helped put a plan together for the first fight wasn't present, consequently creating the risk of detonating the fuel tank in the first place. So yeah, Asbat is the bungler. In any case, the comic ends with Jean-Paul returning to the bank cave to tinker with his costume some more. These two issues are okay. Ostensibly, if we're working from the perspective of trying to present these um, Asbat stories from the idea of that, in fact, the plan was to have Asbat be, the, or to present Asbat as becoming the status quo for ultimately the readers to welcome 
Bruce back once it turns out that no, this isn't going to be the permanent thing. Um, this is to a certain degree, one of the things that you would expect to get a couple standalone stories, not necessarily involving the larger, um, for lack of a better term, rogues, um, universe, even of DC comics to just do the, to tell these smaller stories. In the in this case, our first story is something of a um, while it's not written by Denny O'Neill, it would fit the category of some of the Dem Denny O'Neill human interest stories, the our political commentary story or social commentary stories that we've gotten back in the seventies, and with the fight against corrosive man. It's Asbat fighting against a more superpowered opponent. We'll get a bit of this later when he has an encounter with um, the Clayface family. But having Asbat encountering superpowered foes outside of the Bloodline storyline fits in with this. Like theoretically, if you're going to do this very long term without going, like, do this for like a year or two while. Bruce goes and does his stuff and eventually recovers his strength and comes back to challenge for the crown to, to regain his the mantle of the bat again. Um, you, you would want to have at some point, say, have a Asbat crossover with some of the members of the Justice League, or even, um, since this is happening somewhat parallel, as we mentioned earlier when uh, with Nightfall, having a crossover storyline between Asbat and one of the, or several of the challengers for the S shield challenge for the Cape in reign of the Superman playing in with the whole, um, with the whole, not to say Trinity thing, um, though you could slip in some, uh, wonder woman in there. Um, but tying into that whole side of things. Is honestly that that is, that is one of the things that Reign of the Superman has that this storyline doesn't. Reign of the Superman did ultimately have that interaction with with Green Lantern in the in the climax of it, whereas here this is strictly strictly Gotham and strictly the Batman Rogues Gallery. It we don't get any outside spillover, which. I understand so why Denny O'Neill likes having the Batman as urban legend thing, but like Batman has been a founding member of the Justice League. And so I appreciate when you have shakeups of the status quo like this, having the reactions of the larger DC universe. It's something that we do get when much later, when Dick Grayson takes the mantle after Battle for the Cowl, because Dick Grayson is a person who has operated in the larger superpower world in addition to the street level world of Gotham. And so he's able to have those interactions at a certain level with a certain degree of familiarity with these other with these larger heroes. And I think one of my big appeals, one of the things that helps make this work, is as is the ways in which Asbat becomes a fish out of water. Um where he is, he is unfamiliar with the Joker and has to go dig through the files to get additional information about Joker's um, style. It's something you rarely see. Is like Joker and Batman have become a long time opponents for so long that it is odd seeing somebody who doesn't know the Joker, uh, who isn't familiar with him and his style. And so having that is is a nice touch when we had that storyline last episode. So we get a little bit of that here with the corrosive man with Asbat having to deal with a super powered opponent for the first, a truly super powered um, opponent for the first time. So it's nice to have a bit more of this from here, but, and now we're coming up on the big, not the conclusion for Asbat, but the big kind of climax of his part of Night Quest of the Crusade. 
So let's, before we do that, let's get caught up on Robin as he teams up with the new version of the Huntress, Helena Bertinelli. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.